Hello, friends, and welcome to Chasing Hazel's Tales, a family history podcast where we deep dive into our family history stories and discoveries. We discuss our friend DNA and share some of the great connections that we have made. And Kim, rumor has it that we need a bell to know when we switch speakers. I guess it's hard to, for people to tell our voices apart. We do understand. It's been a long history of that, but we're not sure how to help. Uh, but I guess you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> I'll help. Here we go. I'm Kim McLaughlin. And I'm Laura Ireland. I guess we can't help more than that. So in this episode, we're going into all the details of our own NPE, how we discovered it, how we investigated it, and what we learned is the truth of our family story. Today, we are spilling the tea. Okay. Here it comes, spilling tea. <laughs> we, but we want to recap just a minute, just so we can bring you up to speed. Um, in our last episode, we talked about Hazel's childhood and high school years. So we're talking about Hazel, Hensler, Lang, Burgoyne. She was our grandmother. Um, and we remember her as most vivacious, as it was said in her yearbook, and how her adopted family, the Langs, were a fixture in Enfield, Maine. We also discuss centimorgans, which is a measurement used in DNA, and NPEs, which is a result from a DNA test, meaning not parent expected. So last week's introductions were, as you just said, Hazel Hensler Lang, who would go on to become Burgoyne, our grandmother, and her parents, her Francis and Julius Hensler from Deer Isle, her adoptive parents, Roscoe and Georgia Lang, her adopted brother, Carl Lang, and his girlfriend, who would be go on to become his wife, Hattie Falloon. And of course, we want to thank our ancestors for repeating all those names. It doesn't make it confusing at all. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a Roscoe Lang, Hazel's adopted father, and Roscoe Burgoyne, who's Hazel's son and our father. And then we have Georgia Lang, Hazel's adopted mother, and Georgia Burgoyne, who is Hazel's firstborn. Right. That would be our Aunt Georgie. Yes, Aunt Georgie. Right. <clears throat> so we stopped last week when Hazel graduated from high school, and we could add one more yearbook reference to last week's. Um, it was noted that her future ambition was to become Mrs. SRB. So... We saw that and said, well, there it is. So SRB was Stanley Raymond Burgoyne. He was born in Howland, Maine in 1906 to Lewis and Jenny Mae Levitt Burgoyne. And they were married on August 4th, 1928. And a marriage announcement that was in the local paper congratulated the popular couple as they honeymooned in the provinces. So they had three children, Georgia Burgoyne, who was born in 1929, Patricia Burgoyne, born in 1931, and Roscoe Burgoyne, our dad, who was born in 1935. So what happened in those years between? Very little was known until DNA sparked our research and we started digging. And, you know, there's one thing that we don't know is like, when did Hazel know when or, or when she found out she was adopted? Like, how did she find that out? I wonder how old she was. Or, we don't have any records of actually even saying what age she was when she was adopted. Right. So we don't know if she always knew or if she never knew. Right. If so, she found out, you know, what kind of problem was that? Right. And the same goes for her brother, Carl, um, because those adoption records just aren't available to us. Right. And we mentioned this because we wonder the effects of discovering different parentage, you know, which has certainly been studied recently, as we mentioned in the last episode. And we refer to one study from Cal State that was from a student's master's thesis on genetic counseling. And the link will be in the show notes, but we picked out a few quotes from that research that were very interesting with describing how it feels to discover you have an NPE. And as you can imagine, there's a really wide range of emotions attached to that kind of thing. Right. So the first quote we have was from a participant named Alyssa, and her quote said, it just felt like this heavy weight was both being put on me and being lifted off me at the same time. It's hard to picture, but it's like the truth being really, really super heavy being put on me while the lie being removed. That is a really deep statement. I mean, that just, that says a lot. Yes. Yeah. It's a great, great comparison. 
And um, there was another participant named Karen who said, I found something I didn't know I was looking for. And it made me realize that I was actually looking for it forever. Yeah, that's kind of almost sad. Mm. Um, and then this last one, who was um, another another Karen, we don't know if it was the same person, but she said, so I did have an inkling. And in fact, when I was waiting for my dad's test results to come back, oddly, and I feel sort of guilty saying this, I wanted it not to be him. So there was something there that that I knew in ways that aren't easy to explain, but still it was shocking. So basically she went from an inkling to she knew it, she didn't want it to be him, and then she was shocked. I mean, so all those ranges of emotions of of your being, of who you are and who you thought you were. Right. And it's hard to know what you we would feel unless you go through it yourself. That's right. I think. Uh, yep. Um, like I said, I just think that this just takes it it just warrants taking a minute to realize what could have been if they found out that we could imagine that these things would affect their lives and the directions that they would go, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no name to it at that time, but it was still a, it was still a phenomenon. And like I said, it's hard to fathom unless it comes to your doorstep. So maybe just, just a little bit of thought there. Right. And, you know, we didn't even have an understanding that this was a possibility when we were doing our DNA test, we really just thought it was going to tell us where our ancestors came from. I've right. never heard of people getting results like this from DNA, you know, that, that they were finding out about, you know, family secrets, I guess. And uh, that was DNA. That was almost a side effect. Wouldn't you say <laughs> a side, yeah. in nursing terms, it's almost a side effect of having a <laughs> DNA test, like something you don't expect. It's not going to kill you, but you know, it's, it's a side effect. So <laughs> adverse side effect, an adverse. Side effect. <laughs> well, not always. I, no, yeah, I, I take it back. I take it's it back. It's just it, unexpected, right? An unexpected right. thing. And, and, you know, Laura and I could, you know, we've, we've done a little bit of research and reading into this and there are a lot of instances where this is not a bad thing. It's sometimes and, a very, very good thing. Right. We can go into that later. <laughs> it's certainly a phenomenon that's worthy of study, counseling, and trying to understand it so that people who do get surprised in the future maybe have some resources available to them. You know, right. it just it takes a lot of time to come to terms with the revelations that are brought forth through this testing. Yeah. And some sometimes what I kind of likened it to was if you once you find this little information out, you then kind of process every memory that you ever had in a new light, in a new way. So every memory, not just one memory, but almost every memory now comes to you with a different understanding of what was really going on. So it is worth some some compassion and a little bit of tolerance for that, for someone who has figured that out. So I just, I often wonder if our grandmother went through that. I don't know. Mm, yeah, it's a good question. So we're left to wonder when Hazel found out and did it affect her and her brother? Right. And, you know, those are just things we won't know, but, you know, to dig into what we saw when we got our DNA results and what some of the things that kind of trickled in, one of our first matches that was a close match was T.R. Humphrey. And this person matched at uh, a level, I think it was first to second cousin is what it was. So 723 centimorgans for me, Laura, and 376 centimorgans for Kim. So, right. and with that, and that relative being that close, and we had never heard the name Humphrey listed in, you know, in our family anywhere. No tree anywhere. No. Right. So that that was a puzzle. Like, who is this person and why are they in my tree? And and for me, the, I know every first and second cousin that I have. <laughs> I know almost all. of. If I don't, I can at least hunt them down or I can connect to a branch or something. Or we've and, at least heard of them, you yeah, know, of the name. And yeah. so this is nothing. Nothing came across my tree at all. And I just I totally was speechless if you can imagine such a thing like how can this happen and and all right we need to know what's going on here <laughs> we right. don't know and, them yet but we need to know right and where does this person fit in what what's going on right yeah um so what i thought we'll, we'll start out by sending out a message to this tr humphrey 
and I said it again and again and again, <laughs> and it was through Ancestry. So I'm not so sure anybody ever got that message. They have a very clunky messaging system. And so I did, I just thought, well, I sent a few little notes saying, hey, you know, looks like we're connected. Do we, do you recognize any of these names? And do, would you like to find out how the, where the connection is? That's kind of how I word my messages. And, um, but nothing, zip, nada. And I tried over, I think, six months or so. And um, I thought, you know, you probably didn't get the last one, so I'll send you another one. And <laughs> anyway, <laughs> enough of that. But, you know, for some people, they check on their ethnicity. They do their test. They say, hey, look, I'm Irish. They log off and they never look again. And right. so that's what I'm thinking. You and know, that could have been the case. Yeah. And you can check to see if you have a match. If I looked on your profile, it would say the last time that you logged into Ancestry. So I'd know if it's been years or last week. But still, there should be some, an email system where if you get a message on Ancestry, you should get a, an email saying, hey, why don't you check it out? But maybe nobody ever looks at those anyway. So right. me, it could go right into junk mail. Right. It's very imperfect. So I... Yeah. I'm I'm not offended that he didn't answer any of my <laughs> any of my little messages. It's okay. We did try on that first one, but it really did stump us. Right. But in the meantime, on another DNA platform, Family Tree DNA, there was a match by the name of Joel Chance, and his Santa Morgans were also in the first to second cousin range. Well, that name didn't fit either. We nothing. <laughs> no, no, the chance we I don't think that we know of any French names in our except going way back. Right. In, right. On the other side. That's yeah. one thing that I've never studied is any French, uh, French connections, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Do you have that French connection? No, we don't have a French connection. In, I've never really. had the opportunity. The French in Maine have really rich resources. And I'm kind of a little bit jelly about that because I've never had the opportunity to go and do any research there because there's nothing really in my family tree. But, you know, maybe I should just check into it anyway. Right. So anyway, Kim reached out to him and he immediately responded. And he said that he was connected to the Humphrey line and was interested in finding the connection just like we were. So then we started comparing information. He's from Southern Maine is right where Kim was living. And I was down there around that time as well, uh, or maybe a little bit earlier. But that didn't matter because that's not where the families were from. So back to the beginning. So he then contacted un his uncle tim humphrey who then turned out to be our uncle tim humphrey as well <laughs> and uh, he let us know that tim had just tested at ancestry as well right so one thing we want to mention is now we've mentioned two new people joe lachance and tim humphrey and we are so fortunate that they turned out to be our research partners because we're not sure how long it would have been for them to check in with us because i'm not sure how active they were but they were immediately interested in what we had to say. So they made researching a potentially upsetting discovery stress-free. And we thank them immensely because yeah, I I think mean, that's we wouldn't a huge be here. thing to mention, right, right? That they were just accepting and as curious as we were, really, I think. Right. Yeah. So when when Tim's results came back, he turned out to be our closest Humphrey match. And he would match me, Laura, at 888 Santa Morgans and Kim at 573 Santa Morgans. So to say we wanted to know who these people are and how they're connected <laughs> would be the understatement of the year. Like um, that is a very close match. We very know who those people were and we didn't. And they didn't know who we were. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so that's when you started contacting him, right? Right. Directly? Right. Because both of us just kind of, you know, all, all we just didn't know what to think. So I reached out to Tim through Ancestry and he, he answered. And so I, I contacted him. He emailed right back and uh, we started with the basics. And basically we hadn't gotten anywhere with Joe except to say that we're connected by the Humphreys. And then in the meantime of that, then we connected with Tim as well. So we started throwing just out some ideas. Well, where do we, you know, how do we, how do our families connect? And we started with who we were, what our names were, where, we, and then we started with where we live. And of course, Tim lives up north and we live, you know, I live in Southern Maine, but 
when I mentioned I was raised in Enfield, well, that brought back a memory for Tim, um, whose father said that he had friends at Enfield. And in fact, his job was the main central railroad that had taken him through Enfield on a regular basis. So Tim's father's name was Gerald Humphrey, and he was born in Newport, Maine in 1898. He served in World War I and returned home to raise a family in Gray, Maine. He had a very long career with Maine Central Railroad. And that information, well, that took a second to sink in, and then our brain started churning, so to speak. Right. You know, Hazel's parents ran the post office, a general store, and whatever various businesses, farming pursuit, or, you know, what they were had going on. So, of course, they would have had probably a lot of dealings with the railroad. And there was also the connection with the Lang family. Um, was Which Lang was Roscoe it? Lang's father and brother. Right, right. 26 years of service for the Maine Central Railroad, which I think we showed um, a clip of that newspaper article in maybe one of our social media posts. I'm not sure, but if not, we will this time. Right, right. So, so yeah. So, and in looking at the amount of shared DNA that we had with the Humphreys, things started to fall into place. You know, the puzzle pieces were Tim Humphrey, some of his known nephews, and us. And what seemed to fit was Tim's father, Gerald Humphrey, being our biological paternal grandfather seemed to be the right fit to make every puzzle piece fall into place. And right. even just talking about it, I just kind of get chills talking about it because it's kind of amazing to me how all of these different pieces came into play to figure this out. And then all of a sudden, click, they just all fit. Once we got, mm-hmm. once we figured out who Gerald was, right. just, oh, there it is. Right. Um, <clears throat> so it makes sense to us that Hazel Lang and Gerald Humphrey must have had some sort of relationship. But was there a way we could find out any proof of that relationship? We had the DNA, and we were excited that our theory was very solid. But there was just one problem. The Humphreys had never heard of us, and we had never heard of them. So how would we ever be sure? And that's where we have Exhibit A. (laughs) (laughs) The the tote full of letters. Yeah. With... Hattie Falloon and Carl Lang writing to each other every day during this time period, and sometimes multiple times in a day, what are the chances that a busybody like Hattie might have written about the goings-on of her soon-to-be sister-in-law's life? And as it turns out, the chances were 100%, because (laughs) several of Hattie Falloon's letters reference Gerald or Humphrey in one way or another, usually... A couple of them I saw in connection to, like, Hattie wanted something. Like, I can remember talk of a radio and something about a ride somewhere. But there was also a letter where she mentioned that she saw Gerald and Hazel at a dance together. Right. Um, And I don't know how many times. So if you if everybody remembers, it was our sister, Kathy, who saved these things from Carl's garage, saved all these letters. And one day we looked at the tote, Kathy and I, and I think maybe, Laura, you may have been there, but we looked at them and we started reading them. And we thought, this is awful. This is all this is, is high school, high school drama, you know, just letters about how you doing, where are we going this weekend, that kind of thing. And just why can't we have butter? Why can't we have butter? (laughs) And I called it drivel. I just said, well, it's nothing anybody really wants to read. Right. And we just... And I don't. I almost wanted to throw them away at one time, but I didn't. I just said, "Well, I'll, well, I'll keep them." You had an inkling. I had an inkling, <laughs> and it made me keep them. I didn't throw them out. But what are the chances? You know, when when we had a thought, huh? I wonder if there's anything in those letters. I thought, no way. But mm. you must have had an inkling too. So I went to yep. the bucket, and they had all been put in um, chronological order at, at a previous sitting. And I looked in 1934, which is when Hazel Lang and Gerald Humphrey may have known each other. And sure than shoot, first letter I pull out mentioned Hazel and Humphrey in the same letter. And I said, it was crazy. It was the first one that I pulled out. And I'm thinking, if that isn't the universe telling us that we're supposed to be figuring this out, I don't know what is. Right. I almost threw them out. 
And then I yeah. the first one I picked out had the proof in the pudding. There it was right there. So we still shake our head. <laughs> we still right. we still just say, I don't know how that how we figured out. We, it's just it's just amazing. Right. And so glad that Carl saved all those things. And, you know, so yeah, we can. Look, and, and we mentioned in our last episode that we think, you know, we wondered if Carl must have wanted us to know this information because he kept everything. So was that his way of passing on the story for later on? Because here it is, <laughs> you right. know, it, right. he made it easy for us to figure some things out, not everything, but some things. Yeah. Um. And so we kind of, you know, and looking everything over, it just seemed like um, Gerald, Humphrey, and Hazel had a lot in common. Um, they seemed to be very social people. Um, and when we started talking with our uncle Tim Humphrey, you know, he just confirmed that he was that they were interested in music. He was Gerald was interested in music and sang a lot, and we knew that Hazel liked to go to parties and things. So that kind of made sense to us. Right. And um, so then Jola Chance would tell us about something that was in Gerald's wallet that just kind of takes my breath away a little bit. Um, Gerald carried the handwritten lyrics of a song called Kentucky Moon in his wallet until the day he died. And we have a picture of those song lyrics. And we took that and we compared it with letters written by Hazel to her brother, Carl, and, you know, not being any handwriting expert, but it sure looked like it was written by Hazel to me. And then at the bottom of the page, it says, sung by Gerald Humphrey in 1930s in Enfield, Maine, in a show there. So. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> to me, that says that he really cared for Hazel. I mean, if right. in fact, this letter, these lyrics were written by her, that he carried a little piece of her with him for yep. the rest of his life. And he just kept that little bit. Right. Um, Joe was the, I think the one who kind of brought it to our attention first, because when he started looking at it, he said, I don't think this, these are the, this is the handwriting of Gerald or anybody else I know. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I sent Laura, the detective to <laughs> scrounge up some of Hazel's handwriting. And yeah. Yeah. And I, she's no expert, but I, I wouldn't doubt her in the least bit. <laughs> yeah. It, it really, it, it really looks like it. And I, um, yeah, that's, it's my belief that it's her handwriting. Right. That makes sense. Yep. Makes sense. So later on, we met with Tim Humphrey and his lovely wife, Doreen. You know, we were interested in meeting each other and learning all about this, this situation. So Tim and Doreen, um, myself and my husband, Andrew, Laura and her husband, Tim, we went and had lunch together in Bangor and just sat down for a second and had a nice little meal and a chat and a introduction to each other. And it was a nice meeting. Yeah, it, it really was. It was a, I, I don't know about you. I kind of felt like that there was a connection to him just immediately. Like but I would agree. There was no, I don't really know how to describe it. There but. was. It was it was just an easy, gentle conversation of somebody like someone you've known all your life. Right. Yeah, that's that's a good way. And if, uh, you, if you stop for just one moment and looked at his hands, I oh. told him at the time I said, those are dad's hands, you know. Yeah. So it so what what it is, is Tim Humphrey is Roscoe Burgoyne's half brother. And just just for the connection. Right. And we would look sometimes at, at Tim and just think, yep, yep, <laughs> your brothers, that's for sure. And sometimes right. it was like being with dad in a way, because dad was deceased in 2000. So, you know, it just, it felt eerie and wonderful all at the same time. Right, right. I, I would second that for sure. Yep. And Tim was so thoughtful. He He brought us a gift and he brought one for each of the five of us siblings. And what he brought us was a railroad spike from the Gray Main Depot with a, a really nice message attached to it. And we'll put a picture of that out, out on our social media. And it said, Main Central Railroad Spike, Gray Depot. This spike was found on the side of the tracks in Gray Main. It's a symbol of the railroad that brought us together after all this time. Yep. I still have it. It's here on my desk. Somewhere. Yeah. I have mine right, right in my other room. Yep. yep. 
that we, you know, we appreciated that. Mm -hmm. So Laura and I did a presentation for our DIG meeting, which if you remember from last week means DNA interest group. And we did it on this very thing, on this very story, because the DIG group was helpful to us in trying to figure out what to look for, what to ask, where to look, that kind of thing, to figure out this whole puzzle. So we really appreciate them. And the presentation was well received. But, you know, we yeah, we got a lot of kudos for that. What's that? We got a lot of kudos for that from the yeah. people that were there. Yeah, it was the first time, I think, post-COVID that they'd had a meeting. So we were all excited <laughs> to be together anyway. But yeah, the 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 presentation went really, really well. It was well received. And uh, Laura and I are booking for parties if you want us to come and give our presentation. <laughs> You'd be so we're cheap. We're cheap. Diet Coke. <laughs> give me Diet Coke and I'm there. So one thing that we noticed, you know, they gave they were generous enough to share a lot of pictures of Gerald Humphrey and the other children. Dad has six other six, seven, seven other siblings from Gerald. And uh, it was very interesting to see all the similarities in dad to like each sibling. You could see. Right. He shared things with each one. I, I would agree. Yeah. A little different. might have been different, but I mean, because Uncle Tim is a redhead. Dad certainly wasn't a redhead. But, but he did have a red beard. Right. He did have a red beard. and uh, But his hands, he and Tim's hands were exactly alike. Mm -hmm. uh, but th there was another brother that his name was Charlie. Charlie Humphrey, and I think they called him Chuck. And we we never met him. He passed before we got a chance to meet him. But he and Dad look just alike. Yeah, a different color eyes, but yep. boy, those eyes the the twinkle in his eye was just the same as Dad's. Yep. It, was, it was crazy. So and then there was the stance to the seeing the picture of Gerald, the father, right. uh, in his railroad uniform, kind of leaning against a house and. I, the second I saw that picture, I was like, oh, that's a Roscoe stance right there. Yeah. Uh, just, Roscoe Burgoyne. Roscoe Burgoyne. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's definitely a lot of familial similarities with the siblings in that family. Right. For sure. But we're, we're very happy to him, for him, for Tim to have shared those with us. Yes. And uh, as, you know, wrapping up this episode. We'd like to leave you with what's one of my favorite quotes from, I'm going to bring it up again, Danny Shapiro's book, Inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> and this was, this quote was something that just really resonated deeply with me because it's a profound change in your life. Your sense of self or who you've known yourself to be has changed when you discover your biological roots are not what you've been told. So her quote goes like this. I'm not who I thought I was, but I am who I always have been. There it is. Mm -hmm. She's very, very insightful. And so join us next week when we'll move on to Hazel's life in the late 1930s and early 40s. She faced challenges in her health, her marriage, while our country also faced challenges and we became involved in World War II. With all the letters that Carl saved, we put together a picture of what their lives were like, and life was hard, whether you were on the home front or fighting the front lines, and Hazel's life was no exception. So please subscribe, rate, and review if you've enjoyed our podcast. And if you'd like to share any of your family history mysteries with us, you can email us at chasinghazelstales at gmail.com. And look for us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. We'll be posting pictures from today's episode. We have a lot to share. Yeah, we have a lot. So we also continue to share in the show notes the links for the Maine Children's Home if you wish to donate because they have a Christmas program going on. That's that's coming up soon. Right. So if you feel like giving five bucks or a toy for a child or just look at their website, they have many different ways that you could donate for their Christmas program. And I also continue to promote Danny Shapiro's website because, well, you should just read her book, Inheritance. I just think it's worth every penny. And so thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.